In our previous video, we'd been sharing the first part of our trip to Cape York and the northernmost point of the Australian continent. We have just crossed the Jardine River and now we are ready to explore the Northern Peninsula area. Or the NPA as we call it up here. So stick around as we visit some amazing places and show you what makes this place so unique. G'day. G'day. Thanks for stopping by. Our next stop, Cecia, where we will be based for a couple of weeks while we travel around the NPA. Cecia is the most northern community on mainland Australia and is home to about 300 people. It is ideally located for exploring the area with access to the tip and the Torres Strait Islands. We plan to stop in at Bamaja on the way to Cecia. The road slash track was a bit rough, but no worse than some of the conditions we had experienced so far. We reached Bamaja in under an hour and pulled in for some lunch at Bernie's Kai Kai Bar. We had heard their crayfish pies were amazing. There was also a great selection of other pies, pastries and fried delights. Unfortunately though, not much in the way of gluten and dairy free options for me. There's also a really well stocked supermarket here. Now Sosia is only a few kilometres up the road and the road is sealed. <laughs> We stayed at the Sosia Holiday Park. The rates were $25 a night with power and water. It was only a short walk to the jetty and the park also had some amazing beachfront camp options. And although it was a bit dusty, the site certainly was plenty big enough for our van and car. Oh yeah, and we were warned about the horses that roam through the park and scavenge any food laying around. We just wander through the campground checking out each site. It's very interesting. What are we up to today? Well today Paul I thought we would go uh, around Bamaja Airport. There's some World War II aeroplane wrecks. Alright. It's something to do around here so we thought we might go and check that out. Alright let's check out these wrecks. Yeah let's go and check them out. So here we are walking down the track. Unsigned track now no less to find one of the wrecks. 20 metres down the track, off the main track, there's a sign. <laughs> Finally, a <laughs> sign. There are two wrecks here at this site. This Curtis P40E Warhawk. There are pieces of a plane scattered around the area. Quite remarkable considering they've been laying here out in the elements for the past 75 years. And further along the track, we found this Beaufort bomber. And both of these planes lay where they crashed. Quite sobering, really. Then driving along a very narrow bush track, which was littered with hundreds of old fuel drums, we visited what was left of this kitty hawk. Then finally we stopped to see this DC-3 that crashed in 1945. This one is situated just off the side of the road to the Bamaja Airport. Departed Archerfield Airport in Brisbane en route to New Guinea on the 5th of May 1945. The plane clipped some trees and crashed at this site in Bamaja. Sadly all on board were killed. We're off to today, man. We're going on a ferry to Thursday Island, Paul. Ooh. Heading over to the pier to get on the ferry and yep. head over to Thursday Island. Island. Well, let's check out Thursday Island. Yep, looking forward to it. Might be our ferry. Not sure yet. A lot of activity here this morning. The ferry trip takes just over an hour and it costs $120 each return. The ferry company also offers a tour of the island for $32 per person. This tour visits Green Hill Fortress with its sweeping harbour views, underground military and maritime museum and the Pearl Shell Divers Memorial and takes about an hour and a half. Today we were here 
It was blowing a gale. But then we heard it always when you're on Thursday Island. The Green Hill Fort Museum was fascinating and a welcome relief from the wind. The fort was built in the late 1800s as part of Australia's defence against a possible Russian invasion. Then, in the late 1920s, it was decommissioned. Then, during World War II, the fort was reactivated as a signals and wireless station. Almost the entire area of the Cape was involved during World War II. Most of the population on Thursday Island was evacuated as the place was transformed into a military base housing. Okay, here's the Australia's top pub on Thursday Island. Apparently it is the pub that is at the northernmost point of Australia. Although it's not on the mainland, it's on Thursday Island, which is part of Australia. So we learnt today. Grabbed some lunch and spent the rest of our time having a look around the town before heading back to the waterfront. We found this great little gazebo. It gave us good views of the bay. It was a perfect selfie hop. Except for the wind blowing my head away. Back on the ferry, we headed back to Cecilia. Thursday Island was definitely worth a visit, with some great attractions and activities around the town. All right, today we're off to Bajinka. Where is Bajinka? It is the most northern point on the Australian mainland. It's a bit of an achievement really, isn't it? It Getting is. Getting right to the top of the mainland of Australia. Let's go. Let's go. So we fueled up in Bamberger this morning. Bamberger is about six kilometres from where we're staying in Seashire. As soon as you get out of Bamberger, you end up back on the dirt road again. And in some places it's quite heavily corrugated. Oh, right there. Uh, like here. We've got about 40 kilometres of this to do until yeah. we get to the, the tip walk car park. Oh, 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 oh. My goodness. Although the road conditions can be challenging, it is a very picturesque drive as you travel through the archway of trees lining the road. But we were quite happy to keep going being driven by the anticipation of achieving this bucket list adventure. So the road into uh, Pajinka, that last bit of the road, probably the last, what, 25 kilometres, is actually really just a track. And um, a really narrow track, in fact. Probably wide enough for one car. Um, but you've got to go really slow because there is... It's, it's not in the greatest condition, really. It's quite it's, a few potholes. Yeah, it's got quite a few potholes, mm. yeah, and washouts and dips. So Paul's been going about, I noticed, about 40 kilometres an hour, that right, Paul? And you really want to take it slowly. Um, not just that somebody else could be coming the other way, because there are some twists and turns, but also that there are these unexpected washouts and dips that you really can't see from a distance. So it's fine as long as you take it slow. We pulled up in the car park and was very relieved to find that they had public toilets. How's that, babe? Well, I wouldn't want to do that every day. It was kind of one of those flat toilets. And then I thought I'll wash my hands and then I'll sanitize them when I get back to the car. So I started pumping the um, what I thought was the water pump. No water came out, but I tell you what came out? A whole nest of ants. <laughs> they, just, they fell into the sink and then they started crawling everywhere and I couldn't get out of there quick enough. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> eggs and everything. <laughs> they were carrying their little legs and it went and it just, oh my goodness. Now that yeah. wasn't fun. I didn't enjoy that. All right, let's see if we can find something better to do. <laughs> Then we were ready to make the final trek on foot to the iconic sign at the northernmost point of the Australian mainland, the tip. It's a bit of a trek, Paul. I didn't realise it was going to be so challenging. 
come looking. And here I have thongs on. At least you've got your sandals on. The walk up and over the hill provides some spectacular views. And then all of a sudden there it was, all those months of planning and we were here within arm's reach of our goal. Did it! Interestingly, we're the only ones here. I thought there'd be other people here, the way people talk, but as you can see. Walking back, we're coming along the lower ledge, but I think that even some of this would be underwater at high tide, and the tide's on its way in, so we can't walk on the beach, but um, I saw there was a lower ledge around the other side, so hopefully we can get back that way, otherwise we're going to have to go up again. So with the tide coming in on the way back, we did take the lower path back, but not quite on the beach. We weren't sure if there was a trail in it, but we found a trail so you don't actually have to go right up over the top. And you come out to the open space here where the car park is. Back to the start. We made our way back along the track back towards Punzan Bay Campground. Apparently the nearest thing to a resort in these parts. We made a quick stop into the croc tent, another icon of the Cape York experience where you can buy Cape York souvenirs. We need to check this out first. Uh, I can see tracks on the other side. There's obviously cars been through. We'll be right. Hunzan Bay is just five kilometres west of the tip and is the northernmost address on the Australian mainland. They have a few different accommodation options, but unfortunately they couldn't accommodate our 23 foot van and that is why we didn't stay here. But we did want to check it out and it does have a restaurant and a bar. So we stayed for lunch, had a bit of a wander around. The restaurant overlooks the golden sand beach and turquoise waters of the Arafura Sea and Torres Strait Islands. All right, we're all hitched up, ready to go. Heading back south from the Cape. Heading down to Fruitmap Falls and Elliot Falls. We're gonna spend a night down there in what they call the gravel pit. So I look forward to seeing what that's like. Just gotta navigate the Jardine River Ferry and we'll be down there in a couple of hours. See you down there. Like the old saying goes, what goes up must come down. And this is something we weren't looking forward to, the trip back down the Cape, the dust, the corrugations. I've heard people say that you only have to do most tracks one way, and the return trip was either a loop or an alternative road back. But not here, you come back the same way you went up, down those dirt corrugated roads. So heading south, as you can see, it's quite a dip down to the ferry. Ooh, ooh, look at that. It's going to be interesting. Here it comes. I better get back in the car. The river level drops during the dry season. And this late in the season can be quite a challenge getting a rig like ours on and off the ferry. Here we are. We made it to Fruitback Falls and Elliot Falls. And um, we know that we can't get the van to Elliot Falls. Um, so we're going to unhook the van here at the entrance somewhere. All right, let's check out the old telegraph track. You get across the creek or ford or whatever they call it, going down here. Um, 
Well, here we are, walking from the car park to Elliot and Twin Falls. A bit of a boardwalk, just nice. Twin Falls was a great place to cool off after our dusty drive down from the NPA. Well, we made it on a bit of this old tally track here to Twin Falls. Yeah, Twin Falls? Yeah, yep. this is Twin Falls. And Twin Falls because it's got this one just above it as well. Yeah. What do you think, Wen? Is this worth the effort? Most definitely. Just take a look at this. As you step out into the rock that forms Elliot Falls, there is a sense of wonder. Just to be standing here watching the water cascade over the rock ledge. It's just breathtaking. What do you think, Paul? Yep, love it. We're headed back down the old telegraph track. So you can see why this place is a paradise for four wheel driving. Some of the more challenging river crossings and climbs are beyond our four wheel driving skills. But this drive was daring enough for us to fulfill our sense of adventure. Welcome to Fruitback Falls. Fruitback Falls. <laughs> As you walk out onto the rock on the top section of the falls, there are numerous rock pools filled with cool, crystal clear water to explore, paddle, or swim in. Or just to sit and enjoy. And in the lower section of the falls, we enjoyed a swim and a play in the water falling over the rock. Fruit Bat Falls is such a beautiful spot. We feel so fortunate to be able to visit these places. Well, time to get back to the van, hitch up and continue our journey. We got back to the van earlier than expected, so decided not to stay at the gravel pit that we had planned and instead made our way to Morton Telegraph Station, which was about another two and a half hours further along the road. It is run as a campground, providing a welcoming green grassy site for our van. The Morton Telegraph Station cost us $12 per person per night, so $24 for us. There is no water hooker, but you can fill your water tanks from a tap with treated water. There are also a few power outlets that are a first come basis, we got one. There is a beautiful two kilometre walking track that takes you to Cave Creek, where the bedrock has been eroded to form a natural bridge. Then down to the north bank of the Wenlock River. So the Morton Telegraph Station draws its water from the Wenlock River here. It apparently has crocodiles. Apparently. We were assured that there were no crocs in this part of the river. They would be further up in some of the deeper holes, chasing barramundi. Still, you need to be alert and check the surroundings. Always. See, this gives you an idea of the amount of red dust we picked up. Look at the colour of that spare wheel. My goodness. Yep, a little bit of cleaning. Once we get back to Cairns. Yep. After three very enjoyable nights at the Morton Telegraph Station, we went across to Weeper, a mining town on the western side of the Cape. We were advised to drive along the Batavia Downs Road, as it's in better condition than the Bypass Road, and quicker. The road was in reasonable condition 
and there was no traffic coming the other way. This river with a one lane bridge sneaks up on you so fortunately we were not going too fast as we would have had to have given way to any oncoming traffic. And then in what appears to be the middle of nowhere, traffic lights. about two hours to get to Weeper. We booked into the Weeper camping ground for a week. It cost us $47 a night with power and water hookup. The park is situated on the beach and the sunsets are magical. Okay, today we're heading out to a Weeper mine tour in this little bus over here. Already nice and hot. Oh, yes. Looking forward to this little adventure. The Weeper Town and Mine Tour runs for about three and a half hours and costs about $40 per person. Carter's our guide provided a really engaging tour with a very insightful introduction to Weeper the town, how it functions and why it developed as it is. So I've just been out to buy a cast net we were here earlier with our jig, nothing. We saw someone with a cast net and they got heaps of fish in just one cast. So there's heaps of fish in there. So Paul's going to have his first attempt at a cast net, our new cast net. Here we go, Paul. You ready? Okay. Yeah, maybe not. Fish bowl. A little tiny fish you got. A bit too small to keep. <laughs> That's when it comes to bait fish, babe. <laughs> I don't think we've got a hook that small. Oh, that's a, getting a bit better. We booked a Western Cape Eco Tour, which costs $45 each. We boarded the boat at Evans Landing and then headed out across the waterways for about an hour and a half. The bird life here is prolific, and we haven't got to see a croc basking in the sun. So pretty much packed up, ready to go. The van's been disconnected, it's a matter of hitching up now, heading off. And after five weeks on the Cape, we really start to leave. Almost ready? I am ready. All right. Humidity's starting to rise here in this past oh, a few days, really. It's starting to really kick in, hasn't it? Yeah. Hey, noticed it. Yeah, we've really noticed. Mm. When it gets to 35, it feels like 40 hours. Yep, very thick. So, timing it well. It is the end of the holiday season here, so the park's thinning out. Not as many campers around these days. Oh, from here, we head down to Cohen as our first stop. Whether yeah. we stay for the night. Yeah. See we go. Right. We might have to stop for a wee stop long before then. Mm. Alright, next stop, Laura. We headed back out to the Peninsula Development Road. This section of the PDR, just out of Weeper had extensive roadworks going on and the conditions deteriorated even further with recent rain. You can feel the van drifting in the mud. Scary. So I've pulled up here at the PDR Bamiga Road Junction. Bit of a toilet break. We'll check out how much mud we picked up going on that road. My goodness, that was a lot of dirt there. Have a look at this. Oh my. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a clean up. We picked up a bit of mud along the way. So, yeah, it'll be interesting giving that a bit of a clean down. We decided to travel all the way through to Laura. And although it's about a six hour drive, it means we'll be back on bitumen. No more corrugations, no more dust. Pulling into Archer River Roadhouse for fuel, 
we couldn't help but laugh at the cow just wandering around the fuel pumps. <laughs> How much more dirt road do we have on this trip? We have one more section of dirt road to go. I think it's about five k's of dirt. And that's it. No more corrugations. Woohoo! Yay! It's no more dust clouds. Oh. <laughs> and no more dust. Yes. We'll tell you about that later. <laughs> <laughs> Lakeland. Paul's pumping up the tyres. Unfortunately, Laura didn't have enough data reception for us to be able to work here. So we kept going back into Cooktown. So after five weeks on the road, we've come back here to Cooktown Caravan Park. I tell you what, it's a lot quieter now than it was when we left five weeks ago. Obviously the end of the season. But the van is held together. Bit dirty, a few things have gone wrong. We didn't make it completely incident or dust free. Twice the fridge door opened while we were traveling and there were a few places where dust was still able to get in. We got some red dust in here next to the shower. The washing machine cupboard seemed to cop at the worst with the red dust in here. Overall, the caravan worked well keeping the dust out. There was no dust on the bed, bench tops, or in the cupboards. The only place it was able to get in was through the plug under the washing machine and the vent at the bottom of the fridge. On two occasions, we had a fine layer of red dust on the couch, and we had a couple of spots where the dust settled onto the floor near the fridge and the washing machine cupboard door. All right, so today we're going to start cleaning up this mess. We've got to get into this red dirt down here. Oh my goodness. Then we're going to get that out. I don't know. Can we <sighs> Next, we had the fun task uh -huh, of cleaning the van. We found a truck wash in Craigley just outside of Port Douglas. The wash bay had a platform that allowed us to reach and clean the top of the van. It was a lot of work getting the van clean, but the memory of our Cape York experience still fresh in our minds, we both agreed it was worth it. But it is a lot of work. All up, we spent about $40 here washing the van. There you go. The first go of getting it clean. Not bad. So we did it. Six weeks in some of the most remote and challenging environments that we have encountered. Was it what we expected? Definitely, and more. It was so much more, wasn't it, than just ticking off something off our bucket mm. list. The places, the people, the culture just the raw beauty of the environment. Would you recommend the trip? Yeah, 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 I would. But you've got to be prepared for the, you know, don't you, for the, the red dust and the corrugations and the going without many and a creature comforts. Yeah, the ones we've come to expect on our trips nowadays. Yeah. But I think you'd agree, you're rewarded with one of the most amazing life experiences. I think researching the trip before we left certainly added to our experience. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't know what, what services were available on the Cape because yeah. they're limited. Yeah, they are. They are. 
you know, fuel. I remember one place, it, it didn't have any unleaded fuel and I wasn't getting any deliveries for a few days. You know, you've got to be prepared not to have any telephone or internet reception mm. in, in yeah. most parts of the Cape. Well, there was only really Telstra towers on the Cape. Yeah. And even then, sometimes only 3G towers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and the other ones, the, the alcohol restrictions. Yeah. But many of the towns, you're not even allowed to have alcohol in your car as you travel through that town. Yeah. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about our trip up to Cape York. Just let us know in the comments below or on our Facebook page. Or if you see us around, just drop by. Thanks for stopping by. Bye for now. Bye.